Hello, this is Shackleton. I'm Paul Beckwith. So he uh, he's a bit annoyed at me because uh, he wasn't able to go in the last um, few videos, uh, two of them being in a boat and one of them with very loud fireworks. But anyway, he's uh, he doesn't know that he was much better off missing those two experiences. So in this video, I'm going to talk all about the Blue Ocean event because it's a very important question as to when we have the September with the first September with no Arctic sea ice, a completely open Arctic Ocean. You know, what will it do to climate systems? What will it do to the Arctic? What will it do to the jet streams? What will that happen do to the rest um, weather patterns around the planet? You know, when will it occur is obviously one of the biggest questions, and I'll try to answer that. You know, in this video, or I'll, I'll give my best uh, uh, estimate, my best viewpoint on when when this will happen. You know, in this video and and the next one. So we'll call it the 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 blue event the blue blue ocean zero okay the first blue ocean event so boo hoo okay so if boo happens september of say 2025 or 2023 or you know whatever day whatever year boo happens blue ocean zero happens it's there, there's a there, you know, and it's difficult to pin it down to a specific year. I mean, we can look at the trends, we can see what's happening, and we can come up with, try to get some sort of ideas as to probabilities of of when such a thing will will happen. But it does appear that after it happens, within about two years, the duration of of open ocean in the Arctic would extend from just September to to August, September, October. So it's, so within a couple of years, so blue ocean plus two or blue ocean plus three years, you know, no sea ice, August, September, October. By about blue ocean plus five or blue ocean plus six years, you can tack on a month to either end probably. So July, August, September, October, November, completely open Arctic Ocean, no sea ice. And by blue ocean plus less than a decade, it's highly likely that there'll be no sea ice year round in the Arctic. The Arctic will have transitioned to a much different world from today's Arctic. And our climate, our weather patterns around the world will also have transitioned to much different conditions. It's obvious that with no sea ice in the Arctic, the last bastion of cold will be Greenland and the ice on Greenland. It will be exposed. It will be alone in the Arctic as the last cold place. So obviously the melt rates of Greenland, the cascading from, um, you know, the, the, the speeding, the, the, the motion of the glaciers on land will increase the um, sea ice will, the, the, the ice shells rather, will calve a lot more frequently. You know, we'll get huge uptick in mass loss of Greenland ice and that will obviously ramp up sea level rise significantly. Since the centroid of the cold in the Arctic will shift to be centered over Greenland in a world with no Arctic sea ice, center of Greenland's about 73 degrees north. So that means a shift of the centroid of cold from the North Pole, or slightly offset from the North Pole towards Greenland now, to about 17 degrees, uh, 17 degrees south of that to set that 73 degrees north. So obviously, too, the jet stream will be much, much slower and much, much wavier than it is now, much more fractured, 
you know, and centered at over the center of Greenland, not centered over the North Pole. And this is this will have huge ramifications for weather patterns around the globe. So one of the things that may actually happen is that the jet stream can get quasi-permanently stuck. By quasi-permanently, I mean stuck in, say, sum summers to, you know, a set configuration of ridges and troughs, set in winter to, a, to stuck in winter to a set configuration of, of, of troughs and uh, ridges, only to be only to change from those that phase locked type condition um, during seasonal changes. Okay, so it won't be stuck year round. It will be stuck, you know, very very possibly be stuck during seasons. So it's like, in other words, the monsoon is stuck on and the monsoon is stuck off for certain places. You know, our planet will become a much more monsoonally driven world in terms of the, the weather patterns. You don't have jet streams to guide storms. The storms will mostly be determined by land-ocean contrast. And we'll get set into these, um, set in, 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 or stuck in these monsoonal-like patterns. So the problem is, you know, we're already seeing a bit of that. I mean, some regions will get torrential rain um, for extended periods of time. You know, if the monsoons are stuck on in a region, I mean, those, those heavy rain, basically, you know, we're, we can, if the jet streams do in fact get stuck, um, we're going to be divided into a world where if you're in a trough of a jet stream, it's going to rain almost continuously. It's going to be a bit cooler. You know, if you're in the ridge of a jet stream permanently, quasi-permanently for a whole season, say in the summer, so heat waves and drought, you know, all summer long in, in, in that specific region. Neither region is conducive to growing food in, in any quantity, right? If it's If you're in the trough part of the jet stream it's continuously raining the soils are saturated you can't really grow stuff in conditions like that if you're in the ridge of the jet stream where you're always under these tremendous heat waves you know and drought like conditions you can't grow food either in that condition so this is going to obviously be a, a huge problem to humanity's uh, survival and well-being well, well-being, uh, or e and even survival. I mean, the existential questions do come up. The other, another thing to th think about is, you know, where where would you want to live in that type of world? You know, where would you live? Would you live in? You know, you might be able to grow some things in the transition zone between these quasi-permanent ridges and quasi-permanent troughs, because. Because if you're in the transition zone, so you're right along the border of the jet stream somewhere. You know, if, if you're on the border where the jet stream is rapidly swinging from north to south or from south to north, right, there can be some slight phase shift of these waves. So you'll get rain sometimes and heat and drought other times, but it will probably switch a little bit back and forth from one to the other. Um, this is with slight, you know, uh, slight movements of the phase of the jet stream from the locked position. Um, if you're at the peak or the trough of the jet stream, you know, perhaps that would be a place you'd want to live. But of course, the peak can go right up into the Arctic to the North Pole. As we've seen, the trough can go as far south as to the equator and cross into the southern hemisphere, as I've, as I've also shown, um, although that's still controversial, controversial. So the question is, is, you know, and, and of course these quasi permanent jet stream configurations would then vary uh, with the seasons. So you could think of them be, of, of, of maybe three or four patterns that where you live, you get stuck into. Okay, um, you know, you're stuck under a ridge, you're stuck under a trough, you're stuck in a dividing zone. You know, as seasonal changes happen, the amplitudes can change, etc. 
the exact locations can change. So, so that's the type of thing um, that I'm thinking about. You know, the type of world I think where we're rapidly uh, heading to, you know, business as usual. So the biggest question which people ask, though, is when will the first blue ocean event happen? When will the sea ice, the Arctic sea ice volume go to zero? OK, so let me talk now about this recent paper that just came out um, and it is available um, it is open source, and this is the key finding of this paper. Okay, so PO mass, the normal PO mass curves run from the beginning of the satellite era, 79, to present day. Um, and I, you're, you're, a lot of you are familiar with those um, curves from the PO mass, and I'll, I'll remind you of them in a bit, but I want to talk about this paper first. So what they did is they extended it back and, and there, was a, there was a period here where the sea ice volume was decreasing. Um, this is from about the turn of the century to 1940 and then it was increasing and then decreasing. So if you look at the slope, the red slope, the trend is minus 3,805 cubic kilometers per decade. A cubic kilometer is, imagine a kilometer long kilometer wide and a kilometer high. This is what a cubic kilometer of ice is. So this is the loss. We're losing 3,805 cubic kilometers volume of sea ice per decade. That's the slope of this line. That greatly exceeds the slope of the drop here in the early 1900s, which was 576 cubic kilometers. And they don't have the slope for the increase here from war years to um, the 1980s, the beginning of the satellite era. But there is a lot of variability in this curve. And if you look at this slope here, for example, it's much larger. Now, how much sea ice is, Arctic sea ice is left? Well, in the, in the minimum, 2012, there was about 3,000. Um, there was about 3,000 cubic kilometers of ice left. Okay, so, you know, and there has that was the minimum. I mean, the ice left after subsequent years and previous years to that, since that was the record, are you know larger. Um, you know, you could argue, you know, within a decade, right? If we lose, minus, you know, 3,800 and five cubic kilometers, that would be down to zero. In fact, if you know, we'd only, you know, it wouldn't take a decade, it would take less than a decade. If we were more following, let's say, so this is the slope of this drop, 3,805 cubic kilometers per decade. If we doubled the slope, so this starts at about 1980 and ends at about 2010, so three decades, if we double the slope, that would bring us from here, we drop to this level in about halfway through this interval, so in 15 years. So the slope would be more like this. If we tripled it, the slope would be more like this. We, we drop this distance in, in a decade. And this slope is closer to this, it's quite close to this slope. So instead of happening in a decade, um, that would be in a third of a decade to give you a slope like this. You know, so if we maintain one of those curves, the ice would basically be gone in three or four years. Okay, so, you know, it's a guess really to know exactly when it will be gone. But the conditions are such and the situation is such that it could be, you know, a lot sooner than most people think. Okay, so this is an article um, this study uh, came to my attention just earlier today. Zach Labe tweeted this, and the statement in the study was, the sea ice decline over the 1979 to 2010 period is pan-Arctic and six times larger than the net decline during the 1901 to, to 40 period. So that's comparing these two slopes. Okay, so that triggered me to this paper, um, which I'll talk about in more detail next video. Thanks.